traders, Rich here. Um, today, I thought I'd uh, discuss something that continually gets raised year upon year upon year, and that is the notion that trend following is dead. Um, look, whenever um, uh, people, um, it, due to people's um, short-term expectations, um, the assumption is that um, if um, their returns have not significantly improved over a short duration such as six months, a year, two years or whatever. The assumption is that suddenly uh, the notion of trend following is dead. Now there have been studies conducted over the last 200 years, uh, that have looked at research over the last 200 years, that conclude that uh, momentum and uh, trend following is persistent um, in the markets. In fact it has to be. Uh, for that is the only way from price to get from uh, a lower level to a higher level or from a higher level to a lower level. Um, so um, to state that trend following is dead is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, what is really being meant by that statement is a level of frustration in the fact that uh, trend following does not necessarily deliver a regular expected um, return. And that is simply attributed to the fact that we are dependent on when the market trends. Um, if the market is not trending, we stagnate or we enter drawdowns. If the market is trending, we en enjoy these very favourable outcomes. So um, I'd just like to ram this home by visually looking at a few common charts of some markets uh, to, to question that notion that trend following is dead. So. Uh, what I've done here is I've put up the, the monthly charts over long-term data from about the 1970s or 1980s up to current day, looking at the monthly charts for a broad number of common instruments that are traded under a diversified portfolio. Um, this example here is the Euro USD um, in our um, in the video yesterday that we produced, uh, we demonstrated a trend following system that works very effectively on the Euro USD. You can clearly see that trending conditions are omnipresent throughout the entire time series. Um, there doesn't seem to be any abatement of trends, um, they're alive and well. This is on the monthly time frame. When we look at uh, crude oil, uh, we see that there are periods of, of stagnation in price, but then these majestic periods of outlier moves in price. And we'd be familiar in those times, such as 2005. Um, and um, so clearly this instrument trends, has always trended, and will always continue to trend. But there will be unfavourable regimes. In this case, the unfavourable regime was between 1983 up to about uh, 1999. Um, so in that case, we had um, you know a 15-year unfavourable period. But then we had these amazing um, uh, trending periods, which lasted a few years, um, both long and short. Um, and here's another short phase here. So clearly, this instrument trends and will continue to trend. It must. Here is. Um, the US 500, the S&P 500. Well, we clearly know that's been trending. It's been trending uh, for the last 10 years at a glorious rate. So uh, the equities certainly have been booming over this 10-year period. That trend is accentuating. It's an exponential trend. Um, so it's not as if trend following is dead. Um, in a diversified portfolio, we'd have some exposure to um, US equities. Um, the pound USD. Uh, that has had um, clearly strong trending periods, but uh, we're going through a pretty unfavourable patch at the moment. There is a slow decline associated with, with the Brexit uh, from this period uh, down to here, but clearly, overall, there's trends. Um, AUD, USD, once again, we get these trending periods interdispersed with unfavourable regimes. Um, copper. Um, we've had um, some very strong trending periods uh, between uh, 2004 up to around 2012. Um, and for um, gold, um, well, that's a beautiful exponential trend here uh, between 2001 up to around about uh, 2010. Um, we have wheat 
Uh, once again, lots of subdued periods with these commodities, these soft commodities, but um, during particular times they take off and lift to the heavens, long or short. Um, and here we have palladium. This is an example of a clear classic current trend that is underway um, in palladium, which is um, um, enjoying spectacular returns as we speak. So, in general, when you look at the long-term history of any liquid instrument, um, you find that there are trending periods. But the trending periods don't necessarily correspond to your requirement of when you want the market to trend. And that is because um, our trend-following systems, the market dictates terms to us. We can't demand a trending period when none exists. But look, what we need to do is drill down into a bit more of the detail because clearly we've seen overall um, trend following performance of a lot of, a lot of the diversified systematic trend following CTAs um, progressively decline over the last decade. Now, there are trends, we can clearly see trends, but there is something happening within those trends that we believe um, is one of the reasons for the difficulty of, of trend following when you do not adapt your systems to uh, more recent market conditions. So to understand this, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at a trend following model using, um, in this case, uh, we'll use one of these we've looked at. Um, so we'll use um, AUD USD. Now, what we're going to apply here first is um, a percent trade risk. Now, in um, yesterday's um, video, we demonstrated how um, the significant um, improvement in overall equity over the long term is facilitated by the principle of compounding. Now, what that means is that a compounding is effectively a leveraged method of accelerating your returns when you have um, a, a positive expectancy. Now, like any forms of leverage, it's a two-edged sword. If you don't have positive expectancy, you're going to find, um, and you have negative expectancy, compounding actually accelerates um, your downturn in equity. If you have positive expectancy, uh, compounding exponentially um, accelerates your growth in overall equity. So what we need to do to understand what's going on with these markets is the first thing we do is we need to undertake our tests by deleveraging them. So in other words, applying a fixed dollar risk or a fixed lot um, to our, our testing to see actually what's going on in the underlying markets themselves without the impact of compounding um, obfuscating um, those overall results. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to run um, AUD USD over a long-term backtest uh, and we're going to use a fixed dollar risk of $500 per trade starting with uh, an opening equity um, in our test of $100,000. And we're going to run this to see exactly what's going on. Uh, we should be able to see that um, in the early decades um, of that instrument, uh, we might see a, a, a significant growth in our overall equity. And we might find that in the last couple of decades, things have got a bit tougher. Uh, that's not to say that trends don't exist it's to suggest that trends have changed. So what we'll do now is we'll run this and see how we go. So we'll put it on visualizer and we'll put up the equity curve. Now remember this is a fixed dollar risk applied to AUD USD and we're going from 1980, I'll just check that date, 1980 up to the current day. So in the early years, um, in the 1980s, we had a significant rise in our equity um, and remember this is excluding the impact of compounding. So uh, from, from um, I'll just look at this date here, from 1985 up to um, 1988, it was fairly flat, then we had a bit of a lift in our equity. Things start to become more subdued as we go along. 
Um, we do get these lifts, favourable lifts in equity, and we are getting an overall rise in our equity curve, but things seem to be changing. Why? Uh, we'll go back to those monthly charts in a second. As we'll continue on with this back test, and we'll speed things up so we can uh, know we're as fast as we can go. So we'll just see how this plays out. We're up to the year 2000. Things have been um, slowly increasing, but we didn't get this dramatic boost in equity that we experienced in the, in the early decades um, before 2000. Uh, now we're up to 2003. We're still getting trends. This is a classic trend here, a nice long trend, three solutions being applied here. Um, we're still in a long trend here. Our equity is lifting. From 100,000, we're, we're almost up to a uh, million dollars in equity. So things have been going well, but certainly the growth has been more subdued. And we're now up to 2008. We're entering the, um, uh, the GFC period. We get some nice short trends here, get some nice long trends here. So things are moving, um, getting a positive return, but it's certainly not what we used to get uh, before the 2000 period. So this is the, the 80s through to the 90s, for instance. Um, still getting, so trends are still occurring, we're still capturing these trends, but one of the things we are doing uh, within these models is we are not adjusting our models as time goes on. We are using the same models right from the outset, right throughout the course of this entire test. So if trends have changed fundamentally, we would need to be adapting our models. So in the old days when um, the turtles uh, were operating and they performed very well between the, eight, I believe it was the 80s to the 90s, um, when you apply those trend following models with the exact same value settings now, it's more, more difficult to achieve um, the outcome that they're experiencing during those days. Now, Perry Kaufman has got a lot to say about the, um, the evolution of markets uh, from fairly uh, emerging markets um, that have a limited number of participants in it. Um, and as, as markets become more evolved and more and more participants start um, interacting in the market, uh, the notion of simple things such as simple trends becomes more complex. The increased participation from a range of different um, uh, participants, such as banks, intermediaries, speculators, uh, their impact actually um, creates a degree of variation and volatility within the markets. Um, mean reversion starts playing a central hole when, when uh, central banks are undertaking quantitative easing measures, um, as they have been in the last 10 years, um, by releasing gargantuan um, uh, you know, fiat currency into the markets, um, and everyone is um, buying the dips and selling the tips. That mean reversion nature has been overwhelming the general tendency of markets to trend. But now, okay, so. This is the overall backtest using a fixed dollar risk. So you can clearly see that while equity, equity has been slowly increasing, in this instance up to um, around about $861,000 from a $100,000 start, um, you will see that it's been very subdued uh, from this period here, which is 1989 almost, um, right up to current day as opposed to what was enjoyed in the past for this particular instrument. So this is how you detect what's going on with the underlying market. You eliminate the impacts of compounding. So I'm now going to run a back test without the visualisation. We saw this yesterday, but um, with, um, with a, a, fix, a, a percent trade risk as opposed to a fixed trade risk. Now this therefore applies compounding to the series and you will not see this impact when you apply this. I'll show you what happens. So here we go. Over the same time period you can see that as we progress our lot sizes are increasing as our equity is increasing at this point here we are we are achieving maximum lots that our brokers allow so we can't actually get any benefits of compounding through this period here. But we can see um, that um, our equity curve is a totally different shape to what it was when we were applying a fixed dollar risk. 
you can see that it becomes more volatile. Um, that is the impact of leverage starting to affect uh, uh, equity. Um, and you can see that the returns get much more significant. Um, whereas before we were dealing with a um, million dollars in equity, now we're up to, um, we're up to uh, three, four, five, six, 20 million dollars. Now this is just the impact of compounding on our return stream by using a percent trade risk. So under this scenario, um, you won't see this impact of deterioration of trend quality over the course of time. You'll think everything is roses and uh, things are working well. So here we are at the end of our series here and I'll just wait for the report. Um, this has been a very powerful move, um, exploiting trends, but remember we are, we are exploiting trends the same way as we have been since the beginning of the series, 1980. There has been no adaption in our models over this time, time period. Still producing the report, so we'll just wait until it um, produces the outcome. But as you can see um, from this period here, which is um, from 2016 through to current day, things haven't been too good for um, AUD USD, but the trends still persist. And um, if you're looking over the long term, um, you achieve a bonanza in your overall results. So yeah. we, we achieved a $23 million um, equity result at the end of the 50 year, uh, 40 year period with a $100,000 start. Our profit factor is 1.64, and our relative drawdown in this case uh, is quite volatile. We at, at received a 41% drawdown over that 40-year period, which is less than uh, what you'd have received on a buy and hold with the S&P 500, where you would have endured two uh, plus 55% drawdowns, um, and your overall rate of return would have been far lower uh, than what's achieved through these models. Um, so. Let's now go back um, to that chart, those charts. So in the AUD USD, I'll just see which one that is. Uh, this one here, let's blow that up. So on a monthly basis, trends are still evident, but the quality of the trends have changed. Look back in these early periods, look at the level of volatility within the trend itself. You'll see that the trends are very clean. However, now in these more current regimes, we get a lot of volatility. Despite the fact that markets are still trending, there is a lot of volatility. This volatility is effectively noise and mean reversion interfering with the overall trend trajectories. So the way we need to address them these days is to recognise that this level of adaption that has occurred in this complex financial system where things were much more simple and explicit and are now more, um, more volatile and messy, um, this is because of complexity that has arisen from the increase in participation in the market through a range of things such as high frequency trading, uh, the strong growth in mean reversion trading, given that quantitative easing has basically created these oscillatory pattern that people have exploited since 2010 with buying the dips, selling the tips. Mean reversion has been the name of the day for the last 10 years, but that has been perpetuated by central bank intervention. We know that markets want to trend. They always must trend but the quality of the trend changes by virtue of, of the conditions um, and the level of participation and what's going on. Um, so in relation to this, to be able to tackle this from a trend following perspective, you must adapt your systems. So in other words, the systems that were valid over these higher quality trending periods in the past may no longer be valid over these more um, volatile regimes. So um, you need to therefore progressively adapt your systems to take account of the fact that it's not that trends don't exist, it's that um, these other impacts such as mean reversion and the impacts of, of random noise make these trends more messy. 
The way to achieve that is through two measures. One is adaption of your models by, um, by um, effectively data mining over more recent conditions to see what is valid over those conditions. And secondly, to diversify your systems. It, by diversifying your trend-following systems, you are allowing for a far broader trajectory, far more breathing room with some solutions than what would have otherwise been achieved through more traditional trend-following solutions that might have been applicable in the past. So once again, diversification starts coming to the rescue because not only now are we dealing with diversification across markets, now in these more modern, uh, mature markets, um, we need diversification of systems. Diversification of systems and adaption. So look, I thought I might leave it there uh, for this video, so stay tuned for more to follow. Thanks for listening. Bye.